Hello everyone, this week's parsha is Parsha Vayeshev. I heard this for our Torah from Mr. Harry Rosenberg. He's a lawyer uh, from New York. And um, he shared this idea at Machon a few years ago. I thought it was a really great idea. It was a much deeper pers uh, perspective on the story of Yosef and Potiphar's wife. So we'll just get right into it. So for those of you who are familiar with the story, uh, just bear with me. We just need to go through the details um, before we get to the deeper analysis of what was happening there. So again, so Yosef, uh, Yaakov sends Yosef out to his brothers. So Yosef goes, that ends terribly. Um, they almost kill him. They end up not killing him. They sell him to slavery. Um, and he gets uh, brought down to Egypt. He gets sold to Potiphar, who is a high-ranking uh, official in Pharaoh's court. And Yosef does great. Um, Yosef effectively really proves himself. He brings a lot of success to, to Potiphar's household, and Potiphar notices this, notices that he's a very effective individual, so he actually effectively puts him in charge of everything in, in his house, nothing is spared from him, except, says, uh, we're on chapter 39, verse 6, so it says, so just a quick translation. He left all that he had in Joseph's custody, and with him present, he concerned himself with nothing except for the bread that he would eat. Now just quick pause. We need to go see Rashi. What is this bread? Kim halechem. So it says Rashi, he ishto. That's Potiphar's wife. So Yosef could have everything except for Potiphar's wife. Ela shediber b'lashonekia, right? But the Torah wanted to speak in a clean language, didn't want to speak so crassly. Anyway, so what's the rest of the pasuk? Yosef is an exceedingly handsome individual. He's actually so handsome that he's the only male individual who is, who is described with uh, these terms. We've seen Sar Imenu described with these terms. I believe we've seen uh, Rif, uh, Rachel described with these terms. I'm not sure Rifka, but I know she was beautiful of form and appearance. I'm not sure if the Torah actually says that. But regardless, this is always a term we use for women. But Yosef was such a good-looking guy that the Torah decides to use it for him. So here we have this young... Uh, Teenager, vigorous, ambitious, effective, uh, very good looking. And Potiphar's wife, who, by the way, was a legendary beauty, the Chazal tells that she was stunningly beautiful, um, notices this. And so she starts to pay attention to him, um, inappropriate attention to him, until she finally says, Vetomer Shechvaimi, sleep with me. Not very blunt, very to the point. Um, Yosef says, no, I can't do that. I'm going to sin to, to God. I can't do this. Now, now what happens? So again, she keeps acting provocatively towards him. She keeps trying to tempt him and seduce him. And again, she's very beautiful and he's very young and, and a healthy young man. And the, the Psukim later says that uh, in verse 11, so Yosef comes back to Potiphar's house to do his work. So again, then there was an opportune day when he entered the house to do his work. No man of the household staff being there in the house. Okay, fine. And then what? So we need to understand, what does this mean? That is actually a machlok in the Gemara between Rav and Shmuel. So it says Rashi, uh, amar so according to one of these uh, Amorai, it means, look, when it says to do his work, it means to do his work. That's what it means. The Torah says to do his work. That's what it meant. He, he went home to get his work done. But amar tzar, in order to sleep with her, to do to fulfill his needs with her. Right? But at, just, at, just at that moment when he's about to succumb, his father's ha uh, face appeared in the window and said, don't do that, you'll be known as a companion of harlots, and your name will be stricken from the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol in the future, and Yosef uh, is, oh, is able to overcome his desire, and he runs out of the house, and then um, Potiphar's wife uh, is, uh, is offended and accuses him of trying to sleep with her, and he gets thrown into prison, and uh, that whole situation happens. Now, here's where the analysis comes in. A person reading the story, what will they think? Wow! Look at Yosef. Look at him overcoming with uh, with Herculean power uh, his his temptations and his uh, and his lust for Potiphar's wife, and he he gained control of himself. And like, what a guy, right? Yosef. And by the way, this this uh, this incident earned him the title of Yosef Atzadik, Yosef the Righteous, because he's a seventeen year old boy who was being uh, being seduced by uh, by a very beautiful woman, and he was able to overcome, and that was amazing. But was there more to this story? The answer is yes. Obviously, otherwise we won't be talking about it. We need to go to the beginning of this week's parsha. Literally, the second verse. 
So we'll just read it from the beginning. I'm just going to read it in English. So these are the offspring of Jacob. Joseph, at the age of 17 years, was a shepherd with his brothers by the flock. Okay. And he was a youth with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph would bring evil reports of them to their father. It says, What are these evil reports? What was he reporting? So it says Rashi, and again, we'll just read it in uh, English. Any evil uh, which he would see in his brothers, the sons of Leah, he would tell to his father that they would eat a limb which was detached from a living animal, and that they would belittle the sons of the secondary wives by calling them servants, i.e. slaves, and that they were suspect of sexual immorality. Now these are serious accusations that Yosef is, uh, is, throwing, is uh, throwing against them. Again, just to go quick, uh, quickly through them, that they would eat a limb which was detached from a living animal. So that's called aver minachai, uh, that's also by Jews and by non-Jews. So what that is, is before, of course, Jews have to do shechita, right, so that the, the animal is kosher and not a nevela. But even so, there's another, an additional prohibition that even non-Jews are, uh, non-Jews don't have kosher laws, but they do have one in the sense of aver minachai. That is, before you start dissecting an animal to eat it, before taking off its limbs, you have to kill the animal. So, for example, let's say you just want like to stun an animal and then you could start uh, uh, taking it apart. You can't do that. Kill the animal. Once the animal is dead, then you're allowed to take it apart. That is called Iver Minachai, right? Tearing the limb from a living animal. So that's one of, and that's a, that's also for non-Jews. And of course, that's also also for, for Jews. And yet, Yosef was accusing them of this thing. Fine, so that's one. And second, that you'd belittle uh, their, uh, what's it called, his brothers from Pilla and Zilpa by calling them slaves. That's also not a very nice mida and report to bring back to, uh, to Yaakov. And the third, and most seriously, that they're a suspect of sexual immorality. That's a pretty serious accusation as far as we're concerned. Yes? So, what's going on here? So here, uh, Mr. Rosenberg, or sorry, Rothenberg, quotes, uh, quotes Rabbi Malevsky. And he, and he says the following. What was the basis of, uh, of, of these accusations? Now this is actually going back to, uh, to a long-running long halakhic dispute between Yosef and his brothers. That is to say, were they Jews or not? After all, this is before Matan Torah. We ha the Jews haven't studied Sinai yet. They haven't accepted the Torah. And therefore, technically, they're, they're not really Jews. They're not commanded by the Torah to really do anything. So the fee Yosef, they weren't Jews. They were Bnei Noach. They were not Jews so far. Yes, it's true they voluntarily chose to keep the mitzvahs, but even so, that doesn't change their status as non-Jews. The brothers disagreed. All of them, all ten of them, and they said, no, we are Jews. Our halachic status is that of Jews. Now, with that background, we can look at these accusations. What was the base of, of Yosef's accusations towards his brothers? One, Eber Minachai. How does that work? The, uh, the way it operates is slightly different for Jews and non-Jews, but it made all the difference here to look at Yosef. That according to Jewish law, once you've shechted the animal, the animal is dead. Even if it has uh, postpartum convulsions and twitching, the animal is dead, you can eat it. So even if you start like taking off pieces of the animal while it's still twitching, once, it's, once shechita is done, the animal is dead, you're fine. That's not Aver Minachai. Okay, but if you're a Ben Noach, right, if you're a non-Jew, then you can't eat it until all postpartum convulsions have ended. And because uh, Yosef's brothers held that they were Jews, they didn't have to wait that long, and therefore Yosef said, you were guilty of eating a Minachai, because we're not Jews. Fine, that's one. Second, Yosef said that um, his brothers would ri ridicule their uh, their brothers, right, from Bilal and Zilpah by calling them slaves. Now, what does that center on? Because Lafi Jews, Jews can own slaves. So because Jews can own slaves, there's an idea of a, of a Kinyan Aguf to, to own somebody else, and there, and uh, and that exists only by Jews and not by non-Jews, and therefore uh, Yosef was saying that like their brothers were kind of through this understanding would call their their brothers slaves. Okay, so that's section two. What's three? How can we say what does this have to do with uh, that they're a suspect of sexual immorality? So here too, there's a difference. If you're a, if you're a Jewish person and you see there's a non-Jew a non-Jewish woman who's married to somebody else, if she converts, then the marriage is dissolved. As you know, sometimes non-Jewish couples will uh, will want to like as in married couples will want to convert together. What happens is the day of their conversion is also the day of their wedding. Now, why do they have to have a wedding? They're married. And the answer is no, they're not because once they convert, that that marriage is dissolved, and therefore they're single again. So again, 
according to the brothers, they're Jews. So if they take, an, a, by the way, there's no actual, um, I mean, there's no apparently recorded midrash or any source to say that the brothers would actually do this, which is why maybe it says they were suspect of sexual immorality. It doesn't say they actually did this. But the point is the brothers clearly held that if they found a non-Jewish woman who was married, they could convert her, and in that way she becomes single, and then they can marry her, and there's no problem. But Lefi Yosef, who says, we are not Jews, they couldn't do that. Okay, so we see that. That is part one to Yosef's test. Part two is this. The way Potiphar's wife would tempt him wasn't only by being provocative to him, by being sexually provocative and, uh, and visibly productive and physically pr provocative. She actually went to go speak to the astronomers in Egypt and, uh, and asked if they had anything to say about her and Yosef. And the astronomer said, look, we see that you and Yosef are meant to have offspring together in the future. So Potiphar's wife told, told him this. Now, Yosef is a descendant of Avraham, and so he was also a very capable astronomer. So Yosef checked this out. And truth is, she was right. They were going to have children together. So now we need to look at Yosef's test. A. Potiphar's wife is gorgeous. Two. She keeps, provoc uh, she keeps acting provocatively towards him and seducing him. Three. Yosef is a 17-year-old uh, male. Okay? Four. He has found conclusively that they are meant to have, he is meant to have offspring with Potiphar's wife. And by the way, this is actually validated. Uh, Yosef later married uh, Potiphar's uh, adopted daughter, Osna, uh, Osnat. So they did have children together. But anyway, so again, Yosef is 17. There's a beautiful woman seducing him regularly. He has conclusive proof that they are meant to have offspring together. And five, if he just followed his brother's opinion, he could have converted her, made her single again, and then he could have slept with her com with complete halakhika legitimacy. That is a completely different type of test. And yet, even so, we see that he followed Yaakov's uh, um, instruction not to do so. But even so, you can ask, well, hang on a second. To, in, to Yosef's defense, it was him, one guy, against all ten of his brothers, right? And we have this concept, we have a rule of Ahre Rabim Lahatot, you should go after the majority. Whatever the, the majority rule is, that's what the halakhic position is. So I can see that for Yosef. Yosef was just going according to, to majorities. That's perfectly legitimate. But Yaakov said, there's only what, or what Yaakov could have responded to that is, there's only one problem with that. The rule of Ahre Rabim Lahatot is a Jewish rule. It does not apply to non-Jews. And if Yosef was being fully consistent with his understanding of the law, he doesn't see himself as Jewish. If he is not Jewish, he can't hold up Akhri Rabin Lahatot. So it doesn't matter if ten of his brothers or every other sage in the world said, Yosef, you're wrong. The fi, the fi Yosef, I don't follow Akhri Rabin Lahatot because I don't see myself as Jewish. And that was that. And so we see the beauty of his consistency, of his test, of how difficult it must have been. He could, he literally had every excuse in the world to, to, to sleep in, with Potiphar's wife, and even so, he stayed true, he stayed strong, and ultimately, one of the most beautiful lessons here is to see the importance of being consistent with, within your own halakhic position. Shabbat Shalom.